<laughs> Good morning. Good morning and welcome to Moulton First Methodist Church this uh, sixth Sunday of Easter. I uh, hope we're all as enthusiastic as little Natalie uh, over there. It is good to be here and be in worship with you uh, today, this Mother's Day. Uh, my father's side of the family, this is uh, Decoration Sunday for uh, their family, but it is good to be here and uh, be with our church family in person and, of course, uh, online. I know we've got uh, several people traveling to see family uh, this year. This first Mother's Day uh, in over a year, we've been able to really feel comfortable traveling. So we, we pray for those that are traveling uh, this week. Uh, again, thank you for those who are uh, joining us, of course, in person, but also online. Uh, if you are watching online, let us know that you're here. Uh, also, uh, like and subscribe and share our video this morning so that uh, others can see it on social media. I do want to thank you as we continue through this uh, pandemic. Things do seem to be uh, getting at least a little better here. Uh, we still continue to pray for those in India, um, but uh, we will continue to wear masks uh, here in the building uh, all the time just to make sure that we're, we're doing our part and uh, until we get to a really good uh, vaccination um, level here in our community. Just a reminder, our Sunday school classes have resumed. Uh, you can find those details uh, in our newsletter that comes out uh, each week. Uh, also, uh, we don't have a printed prayer list uh, this week, but we will uh, include our prayer list um, in the email newsletter that will come out uh, in the next few days. Uh, just a reminder for our children that are here, our children's church will dismiss after our time of prayer uh, this morning. Again, it is good to be here, to be here in worship and in the presence of God and the Spirit with one another this morning. So as we prepare for worship this morning, let us turn to God with a time of prayer uh, as we open ourselves to the Spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, we are gathered here today as one body because you chose to call us your friends. We come from all walks of life. We've had our share of good days and bad days. And in the world's eyes, sometimes we think we aren't good enough or worthy enough to have this bond with you. But God, in your sight, we are exactly who you need. Despite everything, we've made it here to worship made it to watch, and we've made it to praise your name this day. God, may the love we experience today in worship restore us and revive us and refresh us. God, use our broken selves as tools of hope and love on this day. God, we thank you. Thank you for loving us and calling us your friends. And therefore, open our hearts, our minds, and our spirit to the movement of your spirit through our worship and through all that we do. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Please turn your hymnals to page 370. We're going to sing Victory in Jesus, all, third, um, all three verses. 370. And you can stand. <laughs>
you'll remain standing as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed found in your hymnals on page 881. Let us join together with this historic affirmation. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended in the heaven, and sat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you'll come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The next hymn we're going to do is on page 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We're going to do all third verses, 526. Yes, yay, thank you for Sarah being with us uh, this morning to lead us uh, with our music. Um, ben and family are, are traveling this week. We, we hope they're uh, doing well. As we come to our time of prayer uh, this morning, I invite you, uh, if you will, uh, remind you first, of course, our prayer list that comes out each week. We'll uh, have our printed uh, prayer list again next week, but be in mind of those prayers that come out uh, every week. And if there are prayers or praises we'd like to lift this morning, you're invited uh, to do so uh, at this time. Michael Scott. Thank you, Lori. Yeah, Lyle. Uh, Thank you. 
Thank you, Lyle. For mothers, for the Jones, for James Pinion, and uh, some friends of Lyle's with, with terminal cancer. We certainly lift all those in prayer. Thank you. As Lyle mentioned, we do uh, want to say a special prayer uh, for mothers, for grandmothers, for aunts, for uh, godmothers, and women who have been like mothers and inspirations uh, in our lives this morning. Um, this last year, uh, I think, has magnified even more the importance of uh, not just mothers, but uh, families, as uh, we have uh, experienced uh, extra stress and, uh, and extra responsibilities, especially when uh, school was uh, unexpectedly uh, called off at the beginning of last year. Uh, how important it is for mothers and grandmothers. I, I know uh, how important it was for Laura, uh, uh, all the extra work that she did uh, once Levi was out of school, and uh, how important it was for uh, my mom and uh, her mother to, um, uh, and Laura's mother uh, to help out with taking care of Levi when uh, things got uh, a little out of hand uh, at home. So uh, I know through this last year, uh, it's been so important important that the support of families uh, has been, and we've been reminded of that, and we, we give thanks for all those that have uh, helped and pitched in, and uh, give thanks also that, that we are able to, to spend um, increased time uh, with one another and families that we haven't been able to uh, over the last year. So with those prayers and with those praises, let us go to God this morning with uh, thanking God for our mothers and these prayers. Let us pray. God, in you, every family on earth receives its name. God, we pray this morning that you might illumine all the homes of this earth with the light of your love, granting courage to those who are hurt or lonely, granting endurance to those who care for sick family members, granting wisdom to those in times of, of change, God, this morning we take a special moment to give you thanks for gifts of love that we have received from mother, father, spouse, child, grandparent, or companion. And we give you special thanks this morning for mothers who have given us life and love and that we might show them reverence and love today. God, we pray to the Lord, we pray to you that our mothers might be lifted up. But God, this morning, as joyful and as thankful as we are for mothers, we recognize that this day may not be a, a day of complete joy. We pray for mothers who have experienced loss those who still struggle with grief. We pray that their faith might give them hope and their family and friends might support and console them. God, we pray for women who may not have had children of their own, but who, like mothers, have nurtured and cared for us and inspired us. Women of faith that we look to that we are inspired by, we give you thanks. God, we pray for mothers who struggle. Who hurt and try to do the best that they can. But despite their best efforts, they're 
not able to do what they need to do. We pray that they may find hope, may find courage and strength, and may we and their community surround them to help them be the mothers that that they need to be. God, this morning we give you thanks for those mothers that are no longer with us, those that have imprinted their love upon us, those that their stories we continue to tell, for their life that is carried on through the things that we do. Lord, bless all these women that we pray for, that they may be strengthened, not just as mothers, but strengthened as your children. And through them and through us, let the example of their faith and love shine forth. God, as we have been loved by them and as we have been loved by you, We lift to you our prayers that we have lifted today out of love and and in compassionate care. Hear our prayers this morning and hear our praises and continue to lead us and guide us in the name of the one who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our children are invited to, uh, to go to Children's Church this morning with Miss Joanne.
Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts. We continue our our third week looking at and tracking the movement of the Holy Spirit uh, in the early church in these first uh, few months and years of the early church. It comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 40 through 48. Acts 10, 40 through 48. It says, while Peter was still speaking... The Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And then they invited him to stay for several days. This is the gift of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, my sermon this morning is not a Mother's Day sermon, but it's really in loose terms. Of course, really every sermon, every message that we get from the Bible is about being part of the family of God. And this passage in particular has to do with sometimes the resistance we have to welcoming in new members to the family of God. The the passage that I read here from Acts is really a small part of a much larger story that is really one of the most significant parts of the formation of the mission of the early Christian church. Uh, in, In fact, it sets a precedent for the reason why we can be Christians today without observing and adhering to all the Jewish rituals and customs. The chapter, chapter 10 of Acts, it starts by telling a story about a Roman centurion, a centurion of the Italian cohort named Cornelius. Now, Cornelius, he's not Jewish, but he's a Gentile, and again, a Roman Gentile at that. He's, again, part of the Roman centurions, that royal guard that arrested and crucified Jesus. But even so, he's a Gentile, even though he's Roman, just like the Ethiopian eunuch we heard about last week, he is sympathetic to Jewish teachings, and he worships Yahweh. In fact, his his faith is so great, he is well known among the Jewish people, and his faith is well spoken of by the Jewish nation. So due to his faith and due to him growing in faith and the fact that there was no one to disciple him, God sends an angel to Cornelius and the angel tells Cornelius to go and find Peter. The same time all this is happening, this is the part of the story we might be more familiar with. Peter is minding his own business. He's praying one day, and he goes up on his roof to pray, just like we all do, right? And as Peter is up on his roof and praying, he's sleepy. He begins to fall asleep. And because he's hungry, he has a dream, he has a vision about food. And we know this story, maybe we do, and he has this vision of a blanket being lowered from heaven, filled with all sorts of animals, and a voice coming from heaven that tells him to kill and eat. There's only one problem with that for Peter because that blanket is full of animals that are according to Jewish tradition and ritualistic practices. Some of them are considered to be unclean. So Peter protests and he says, I can't do that. But the voice says to Peter, the voice tells Peter, What God has made clean, you must not declare profane. 
This happens three times before Peter finally wakes up, before he begins to, to internalize this message. And, and he's, as he's beginning to try to figure out what this vision means, he gets a knock on the door, and it's friends from Cornelius who have come to bring Peter to Cornelius. So Peter agrees, and the next day they, they, uh, the friends take Peter to see Cornelius. And as Peter enters into Cornelius' house, Peter realizes that he's not just visiting one Gentile, one Roman centurion. It's a house full of Gentiles. And Peter as Peter does, has a flash of brilliance that is ever so slight. And Peter realizes that this house full of Gentiles has to do with that vision that he has received of the unclean animals being lowered from heaven. But as Peter does and as Peter is, that, that flash of brilliance lasts only a little bit and it doesn't give him enough wisdom to give him humility. Peter says to the crowd, he tells them as he comes into the house, he says, you know, you know that it's unlawful for me as a Jew to be with you Gentiles. But he goes on to say, but God has given me a vision that it's okay for me to be here. It's okay because God has told me that you aren't as unclean as I thought you were. Obviously, it's a backhanded compliment that, that Peter gives them. And, and obviously, it's taking still some time for Peter to fully process what God has told him in this vision. But he's beginning the process of unlearning those customs and those rituals that had caused division, particularly between the Jews and the Gentiles, but were beginning to carry over and continue to cause divisions between the Christians, the followers of Jesus, and Gentiles. But thankfully... Thankfully, Peter is open enough, open enough to the Holy Spirit, open enough and receptive enough, and he's listened enough to the teachings of Jesus to know, to know that God is more than tradition. God is more than ritual. And he's open enough to begin to preach to the crowd, and the crowd hears Peter. And they receive the Holy Spirit. And again, this is one of the most significant moments in the mission of the church. It's referred to with the number of people who would receive the Spirit of, of baptism that day. It's referred to as the Gentile Pentecost because so many Gentiles of, of the centurion's friends received Christ and received the Spirit that day. So that's where our passage picks up that I, that I read, that small, small segment. The passage picks up just after the crowd has received the Holy Spirit. And what we hear in the passage that I read is the fact that traveling with Peter are Jewish Christians who were scandalized by what had just happened. They were the ones, they followed, they followed Jesus, but they also followed all the Jewish customs and rituals, and in addition, again, to following Jesus. And they were horrified at the fact that this group of Gentiles, these Romans, could somehow receive the Holy Spirit just in the same way as they had. They weren't keen on that, and they really weren't keen on the fact that Peter was proposing that they be baptized with water. They were scandalized because of not just they were, they were Gentiles, they hadn't even been circumcised, and they're shocked when Peter suggests again that they should be not just baptized, but of course welcomed into the family of Christ. 
And that's why Peter says what we heard in this passage, how can anyone withhold the water of baptism when it's obvious the Spirit has already been poured out upon them? For a long time, this chapter, and especially Peter's vision, most people tended to think, at least my experience was, tended to focus on Peter's vision itself and and the animals and the food that that Peter was told to eat. And and a lot of emphasis, and good emphasis, has been on the fact that, yes, it's okay for us as Christians to eat barbecue and shellfish and, and things that others might consider unclean. Those are delicious foods. This passage is not about what we eat, and it's certainly not about what we eat making us clean or unclean, or worthy or unworthy in the eyes of God. This passage, Peter's vision, is a vision to give him that understanding that it's not up to him and therefore not up to us to judge what is clean or unclean, to judge who is clean or unclean. And what's more, Peter begins the process of understanding, understanding that message that that Jesus was trying to get across to them every time he butted heads with the religious authority. And the fact that Jesus' gospel, that message, was that God shows no partiality in salvation. It's that Jesus offers salvation to all. And for us as Christians, it's about believing in that saving work of Christ. It'd be an understatement to say that Peter's companions, they had gotten caught up in in the details caught up in the technicalities of, uh, of Scripture and tradition and, and ritual. In, in today's terms, they would be called inheritance or, or biblical literalists. And they were right in the fact that they did have Scripture on their side in, in being cautious about welcoming the Gentiles into the fold. But the thing is, as the passage points out, and as as God was pointing out to Peter through the Spirit, though they weren't wrong, they weren't right either. Thankfully, we see later on that the Spirit that prompted Peter's vision prevails, and we see God's people begin to make a shift. Over the course of the book of Acts, we see the Spirit begin to take hold. And we see those early Christians begin to follow the precedent that Jesus followed and recognize that that it's one thing to, to know Scripture in our head, but it's an entirely other thing to live out Scripture and to love Scripture and love in the way that God wants us to. It's about legalism. And legalism is is nothing new in in religion, of course. This is what we see being pushed against here in this passage. We see it happen over and over, especially in the New Testament. It's the reason that Jesus got himself into trouble with the religious authorities, that legalism cuts off the Spirit. It cuts off God's life in the world. And that's the problem with this legalistic certainty that, that, the, that Peter's companions had. With a legalistic certainty of what the Bible says, it keeps us from being the people God wants us to be to tell us what God wants to tell us through Scripture. To be compassionate to be reasonable, to be empathetic people, to be people who love in the same way Jesus does. To quote Reverend Morgan Guyton, 
He says we don't need to interpret or read the Bible more accurately or more intensely. What we actually need to do is believe the Christian gospel and read the Bible in a way that reflects what we believe which is to say that it's Jesus who saves us, not us, not anything that we do. That's what Peter's companions were were getting caught up on. Those technicalities, they were trying to make those Gentiles jump through extra hoops, hoops that they themselves didn't jump through in order to be seen as worthy of God. But their ultimate goal was not so that they could really welcome in those Gentiles, but was so that they could keep that barrier between them and those Gentiles. Now, it's understandable that that they had a tough time understanding the same thing Peter had. They didn't receive that same vision Peter had. But fortunately they eventually became open enough and receptive enough to see the Spirit at work, to see where the Spirit was already at work in the lives of these Gentiles and and not make that mistake that those, those Gentiles had to perform some other kind of work in order to be saved by Christ. You know, even today, we can get distracted by the details, and we can miss where the Spirit is at work. We can get so focused on the way we worship, we miss the fact that we should be bringing others to worship through the what we do and what we learn. We can get so focused on our comforts, we can forget about the people in the world who are actually in pain. We can get so accustomed to our own dysfunction that we think that's the way it has to be for everyone. And again, we can miss where the Spirit is already at work and where the Spirit has already gone and believe that someone, somehow, somehow someone isn't worthy of the grace of God. The spirit behind Peter's vision is the spirit that leads us to reach out and love the hurt and the lost. Again, it also reminds us that it's not up to us to judge who is worthy or not. To judge the places we go, whether or not those places are worthy or not to go. But that spirit reminds us that we are to go and love and serve in the same way Jesus did. You know, if the last several months have taught us nothing else, it is that we've been pushed to reframe how we think about the church and how we think and what we think of what it means to be a disciple. You know, prior to the pandemic, to mention live streaming or social media and the importance of live streaming and social media to most people in most churches, they would have thought church has no business, that there's no reason we should explore anything or even support anything like that. But though it's still not ideal and and nothing can replace one-on-one in-person connection, there's no denying that, that live streaming and social media has kept us together and has continued to allow us to reach others in the name of Christ. It's even increased the number of people that we can be in ministry to. It makes me think that in the coming months, as we look to do more and as we are able to do more, there's probably going to be even more opportunities that we might once have been resistant to that we are given to reach out to our community. Now, I say probably, but honestly, it's a certainty that we will be given opportunities to reach out opportunities to do something different, opportunities that we might initially say, Spirit is not moving us there. 
but opportunities for us to see if we truly open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to truly see, yes, the Spirit is there and the Spirit is calling us to go there. Because pandemic or not, if we are following the Spirit in the same way Peter did, there's always going to be new things for us to do for Christ. The question is, are we willing to look beyond the things that we think are important? Are we actually going to do the things and be the people God has called us to be? Will you join me in prayer? God of love, please don't let us grow weary of living our lives according to the example of Jesus. You remind us that loving one another is a great challenge and a high calling. Help us not to fail our friend, our family in Christ, our family who is yet to know Christ. Pour out your Spirit upon us and remind us that we bear Christ's love and life into the world. And out of that gift, let us bear the fruit of your love. Lead us and guide us in Christ's name. Amen. Please stand and grab your hymnals and turn to page 557 as we sing, Blessed be the tie that binds all four stanzas. Page 557. As we dismiss today, you'll notice our offering plates by our exits that you might place your ties, your gifts, and your offerings. And as you go, please remember to, to like and share and subscribe to our videos and on social media. Now, let us pray and pray over our offering this morning and receive our benediction. God, pour out your Spirit upon these gifts and upon us. Send us and these gifts into the world as a sign of your joyous work of love. Use them and us to call and welcome into your house and love all who are your friends, all of our brothers and sisters. And on this day, we give thanks for mothers, for women who nurture and provide. Send us forth into your world so that we might nurture and love and provide for others in Christ's name. Send us forth in the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship and the, holy, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.